Consider a vector field, herein depicted on the surface of a sphere. One could project the vectors onto the orthogonal axis and visualize these component resolved vector fields. Such visualization would be useful when depicting streamline flow. However, for a general vector field such as the one we showed, component resolved vector fields is not very useful and intuitive. For a well-behaved vector field, or one that is continuous, there is a more intuitive way of deconstructing the vector field into its constituents. First, we have the curl-free component, or vector fields that is non-curling or irrotational. Sometimes we also call this the longitudinal component. Second, we have the divergence-free component, which is the component that is solenoidal, or curling. In the literature, we also call this the transverse component. Third, we have the component that has no divergence and curl. Given a general vector field, we will show in this video how one can deconstruct it into its constituents. In particular, the curl-free component is associated to a gradient field, and the divergence-free component is associated with a curl field, while the curl and divergence-free component is the harmonic field of the Laplace equation. Let's begin. Part 1. Helmholtz Decomposition and Sources A quick recap. The fundamental theorem of vector calculus, also known as the Helmholtz decomposition theorem, states that a continuous vector field, F, can always be decomposed into its constituent vector fields, herein denoted as Fg and Fc. Fg is the vector field that has zero curl, which means the field is irrotational, while Fc is the vector field that has zero divergence. It captures the rotational or solenoidal part. Fg can be constructed from the gradient of a scalar field V. Thus, we also call Fg a gradient field. The scalar field V is called the potential. Fc can be constructed from the curl of a vector field A. Thus, we also call Fc a curl field. The vector field A is called the vector potential. These are the essential ideas of the Helmholtz decomposition. For more discussions about the Helmholtz decomposition, please check out this accompanying video. For more about the properties of gradient and curl fields, please check out these videos on the same electromagnetism playlist. It is very helpful to think of fields as originating from some sources. For example, electric field sourcing and sinking from positive and negative charges, respectively, is a prime example. Magnetic fields, here produced by two wires carrying currents in opposite direction, is another prime example of a vector field emanating from sources. It will thus be instructive to express these gradient and curl fields in terms of their sources. The gradient field which has zero curl has finite divergence and can be attributed to a scalar source function herein denoted as rho. The curl field, which has zero divergence, has finite curl which can be attributed to a vector source function, herein represented by J. Next, let's replace these gradient and curl fields with their respective potentials. The potential V for Fg and the vector potential A for Fc. The divergence of gradient yields us the Laplacian. This is the well-known Poisson equation. The curl of a curl can be reduced to a vector Laplacian in conjunction with the Coulomb gauge. Note that the definition of curl field is invariant with imposing of the Coulomb gauge. This equation, which involves the vector Laplacian, is called the vector Poisson equation. In summary, the Poisson and vector Poisson equations allow for an elegant way of expressing the scalar and vector potentials in terms of the sources. Evidently, the Laplacian holds the key to our next discussion. Part 2. The Laplacian and its Green's Function Consider a linear differential operator L. 
For example, the Laplacian is a prime example of interest for our purpose. The Green's function, when acted by the differential operator L, would yield the Dirac delta function. For the 3D Laplacian operator, the Green's function is well known and is given as shown within the green bracket. Clearly, the Green's function as defined is not unique, as one can add to it a function k, as long as k satisfy the Laplace equation as shown. The Laplace equation is basically the Poisson equation, but without the source term. As we shall see in what follows, it is convenient to instead partition our vector field into three constituents with the new constituent which accounts for the vector field that is both zero divergence and zero curl. The new constituent follows from the Laplace equation or the Poisson equation, but without the source term. While the first two constituents are called the gradient and curl fields, this new component is called the harmonic fields. Harmonic fields are solutions that satisfy the Laplace equation. An example of the harmonic part of the solution is as depicted on the right. Notice how the fields are converging to the center vertically but moving away from the center horizontally. The center is a saddle point of the scalar potential field. As we shall see later, boundary conditions must be imposed to arrive at a unique solution to the vector field. Part 3 Breaking down a vector field into its constituents. Now consider a well-behaved vector field F. Our task in this last chapter is to explain how one goes about deconstructing the vector field into its three constituent components. We write our vector field as the sum of the gradient, curl, and harmonic fields. Each of these fields can be expressed in terms of their potentials. Since the curl and harmonic fields are both divergentless, taking the divergence of F then allows us to isolate only the contribution from the gradient field. We recognize then that the divergence of F yields us the source term for the gradient field. If we are dealing with electrostatics, then this source term equals the charge density divided by the permittivity. Now, can we work out the gradient field from this source term? In order to execute the next step, we need an identity from George Green known as the Green's Theorem. The derivation of Green's Theorem is quite straightforward, through the divergence theorem and two vector calculus identities as shown. Feel free to pause the video if you would like to inspect it yourself. Using the Green's theorem and letting the phi and psi functions be the potential v and the Green's function, one can arrive at the well-known expression for the potential of the gradient field. The potential depends on the source term as expected, but also depends on the boundary values and derivatives of the potentials. The latter is what is known as the boundary conditions. They are called the Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. We only need to specify one of them to have a unique solution of the gradient field. In this example, we have employed the zero Dirichlet boundary condition to arrive at the gradient field as shown. The divergent nature of the gradient field is very apparent in this visualization. Next up is the harmonic field FH. Let's group the gradient field together with the vector field F. Thus, all terms on the left, highlighted in red, are known. We write again the remaining two fields in terms of their potentials. Taking the divergence on both sides of the equation, and since the divergence of F equals that of FG, we arrive at the Laplace equation for VH. Here we seek a harmonic solution to VH that satisfy the boundary condition as imposed by the vector field F minus FG. More explicitly, we require the normal derivative of VH to be equal to the normal component of the fields F minus FG. With this, one can arrive at the harmonic constituent of the field, as shown. Notice how the fields are entering normally into the sphere along one direction and escaping out of the sphere in another direction. 
This is analogous to the fields of the saddle point we seen in last chapter. We are now left with the last constituent, the curl field FC, which we can obtain directly. However, before I show you the curl field, let's complete the story by working out the explicit expression for the vector potential. One can think of the vector potential as three scalar fields, AX, AY, and AZ. But recall that we have imposed the Coulomb gauge for our vector potential, which then requires it to be divergentless. A vector field which is divergent less can be decomposed into a toroidal and poloidal vector fields. These vector fields can be expressed in terms of the scalar field, TA and PA as shown. The curl field FC, which is defined as the curl of the vector field A is also divergentless. Thus, we can also perform the same poloidal toroidal decomposition. Herein, the toroidal and poloidal scalar fields are denoted as TB and PB respectively. With some vector calculus, we can relate the toroidal and poloidal components of the vector potential A with the curl field FC. Feel free to pause the video here if you would like to inspect the map. The final expressions which relates TA and PA with TB and PB are shown here. Note that TB and PB can be extracted directly from the curl field FC, which we already knew. Thus, the vector potential A can be determined. We show here the extracted curl field FC. Notice how the vector fields are rotational as one would expect. So we have successfully demonstrated how an arbitrary vector field can deconstruct into its constituents, namely the gradient, curl, and harmonic fields. These fields are expressed in terms of the potential and vector potentials, V and A respectively. These potentials in conjunction with their Poisson equations and respective source terms allowed for an intuitive way of understanding these fields. The harmonic field arises as the solution to the Laplace equation and is the field that originates from sources outside the domain of interest. We also demonstrate the importance of boundary conditions in deconstructing our field's constituents.